Some of you people wonder why we say the St. Michael prayer at the beginning of every show. Well, look no further than the Olympics opening ceremony for the reason why. Flagrant spiritual warfare happening in front of our very eyes. The Olympics blasphemes the Last Supper with satanic imagery, replacing Jesus with transgenders. And now they're trying to deny it. I have some comments on this today. Then of all the ways the Democrats are trying to cheat in the 2024 presidential elections, the naked power of the corporate media to rig this election beats everything else. I'm gonna show you exactly what the corporate media is doing and the way Donald Trump can overcome this cheating to defeat Kamala Harris. Plus the super, super, super famous YouTube celebrity, Mr. Beast, I'm sure you've heard of him or your kids have, is embroiled in a massive scandal that's nasty, nasty stuff. But it's a must watch for every parent whose child watches Mr. Beast. Welcome everybody to The Liz Wheeler Show. As always, we are starting today's show with a prayer. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, Cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl through the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Remember, we talked about this last week. The reason that we pray is to order our lives to know God, love God, and serve God. And because there is spiritual warfare around us all the time. We are part of that, whether we acknowledge it or not. It is time we acknowledge it as we fight absolute evil in our country. Part of that, of course, is acknowledging the reality are acknowledging the reality of that spiritual warfare is rooting our worldview in reality. But if you need evidence of this, look no further than the opening ceremonies of the Paris Olympics, which began on Friday with an absolute blaspheming of Leonardo da Vinci's painting of the Last Supper. Jesus and his apostles in the Olympic depiction replace, were replaced by an obese woman and by transgenders. And if you look really closely, there was also a child in this sexualized scene. And if you look really, really closely, which I warn you not to do, the man bending over the child is displaying his genitalia. To be exact, his testicles are hanging out and in full view. It's disgusting. I told you, this is spiritual warfare. This was never about tolerance or inclusion. These are demons who want to force you to worship Satan. This is not the only example of satanic imagery from the opening ceremonies of the Olympic Games. There was also imagery of the horsemen of death from the book of Revelation. Also Snoop Dogg performed at the opening ceremonies and if you look really closely at Snoop Dogg, what is he wearing? He's wearing a necklace with a demon on it. By the way, some say, going back to the blaspheming of the Last Supper, some say that it's a painting of the Olympic gods. It is not actually blaspheming the Last Supper. It was never intended to depict the Last Supper. No, 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 this is false. In fact, a journalist by the name of Pedro Gabriel said, broke it down. He said, here's the full video of the ceremony. If you check the one hour, 54 minutes and 50 second mark, look at how the camera pans and how the various actors pose and place themselves on frame. It's obviously a throwback to da Vinci's representation of the Last Supper. Supper. After that, he says, it immediately becomes a catwalk and there are various different moments in which the catwalk motif reappears. The Olympic gods motif only happens at the two hour, 38 minute and 39 second mark. So you have a depiction of the Last Supper transforming into this Satanist display. Offensive, he says. And no, by the way, the International Olympic Committee did not apologize for what they did. They issued a statement that claimed they never intended to offend anyone and said, sorry if you were offended. Unintentional, they say. Absolute bull. Are you stupid enough to believe that blaspheming the Last Supper with transgenders replacing Jesus and his apostles would not offend the two and a half billion Christians worldwide? International Olympic Committee, you are lying. You did not apologize because you're not sorry. We know it was intentional bigotry against Christians in the name of the communist religion of DEI. Let me be very clear here believe in spiritual warfare. The Olympics mocks Christianity and debases the Last Supper with transgender. And then what happens? Paris suffers a near total power outage. The city was blacked out. Do you think that was a coincidence? Well, maybe, maybe not. Then the first gold medal of the Paris games was won by American swimmer, Katie Ledecky, who's devoutly Catholic. She says she prays Hail Marys before she races. Make no mistake, we are engaged in spiritual warfare and make no mistake, God will win. This is why we say the St. Michael the Archangel prayer at the beginning of every show. This is why we are truly fighting against evil. Today's show is powered by First Cup Coffee. And look at this photo. This is Father Chip. He sent me this photo after he got 
his very first bag of first cup coffee. And this is, this. I asked him if he liked it, if it was good. He said, it's good. A little stronger than medium, I think, but I'm a Dunkin' guy. Better than most K-Cups I've had for sure. Good stuff, guys. Whoa, we're converting Dunkin' guys to first cup. And by the way, I did submit to first cup the idea that they changed their name to first pot in order to honor my husband's newfound addiction. And we had a comment from a user, we can bring it up on the screen here, that says, I've been drinking a pot of coffee for 50 years and I'm fine. See guys, my husband's newfound addiction is actually, sounds healthy to me, right? Healthy. I am so thankful for this sponsor. Any sponsor who is based enough and brave enough to sponsor this show deserves our support. Go to firstcup.com, use my promo code Liz. You can save an additional 10% on your order. And if you subscribe, you can save an additional 10% for the life of your subscription. Go to firstcup.com, use my promo code Liz. My friends, we are witnessing the corporate media's naked power to impact the outcome of our elections and to subvert them. Make no mistake, the coup staged against Joe Biden would not have been successful had not the corporate media, after four years of just ignoring Biden's obvious cognitive decline, suddenly noticed that he's utterly senile in order to push him out to pasture, despite voters choosing Biden as their nominee during the primary elections. We are witnessing outright propaganda. Don't roll your eyes at CNN. The corporate media is demonstrating that they have the power to control the way that people think. As we speak, they are transforming a highly disliked politician, Kamala Harris, who got a measly 2% in her own Democratic primary in 2020, and remaking her image with blatant lies, lies that are disproved by videos of Kamala's own words. Simultaneously, the corporate media are attempting a vicious character assassination of J.D. Vance with utter lies, deliberate distortions of things Vance has said because there is nothing the Marxist left fears more than a politician who has principles, principles begot from love of God, love of family, and love of country, and is unwavering in that commitment like Vance is. Let me be very clear here. Without corporate media, none of these three things would have happened. Kamala would not have been able to push Biden out without corporate media in her pocket. Kamala would still be repugnant even to Democrat voters, except for propaganda for the corporate media, from the corporate media. And J.D. Vance, who actually has the squeaky cleanest record in his personal life, which of course is what the media is trying to denigrate, of any politician out there, would likely be a man both Democrats and Republicans respect and admire because of his life history, except that the corporate media determined that J.D. committed the cardinal sin of being a based conservative Christian white man happily married with kids who goes to church, and thus the relentless media onslaught of vicious lies against him. Do not underestimate the power of the corporate media. They are Pravda. They are the mouthpiece of the ruling elite who are using media to control you the populace, they are subverting the will of the people blatantly and aggressively. Of all the cheating that's already happening in the 2024 presidential election, the corporate media propagandists may be, may be the most significant factor in the outcomes of our democratic elections. However, the left is giving us the exact strategy to beat Kamala Harris. Every lie they tell about Kamala shows us what they fear are Kamala's biggest vulnerabilities with voters. So let's talk about them. So far, the mainstream media in a coordinated way, meaning every corporate media outlet is using the same headline, the same phrases, selling the same lie at the same time, no coincidence, of course. The mainstream media is propagating two big lies about Kamala Harris and her record. First of all, Kamala Harris was appointed by President Joe Biden to oversee the border invasion. Kamala Harris is currently the border czar. At, in this position, with responsibility for security of our border, Kamala willfully allowed the border invasion and continues to enable it. We know Kamala is the border czar. This is established fact. This is not opinion. On March 24th of 2021, Joe Biden assigned Kamala that duty. Thereafter, the United States Congress passed a resolution acknowledging Kamala as the border czar. Yet, the mainstream media is pretending that Kamala was never the border czar. Never. She was only assigned to study migration patterns, they tell us. False. Kamala Harris herself stated that her role was critical in the overall immigration policy of the Biden administration. So why is the mainstream media lying in a coordinated, aggressive way about this? Well, let me read you a couple of headlines and you will see the answers. Guatemalan man charged with sexual battery on a 14-year-old after being previously deported. While Kamala was the border czar. 
Migrant in U.S. illegally was previously deported prior to allegedly killing woman. While Kamala was the border czar. Man who had previously been deported accused of Las Vegas murder. While Kamala was the border czar. Previously deported illegal immigrant charged with the murder of a 25-year-old Michigan woman. While Kamala was the border czar. The Biden administration is flying migrants deported by Trump back into the United States. While Kamala was and is the border czar. Kamala Harris also encouraged people to donate to the Minnesota Freedom Fund, which is a radically leftist organization that believes in no cash bail, which we know is a very dangerous and Marxist policy that allows violent criminals out of jail into our neighborhoods. Kamala Harris tweeted on June 1st of 2020, and I quote, if you're able to chip in now to the Minnesota Freedom Fund to help post bail for those protesting on the ground in Minnesota, end quote. This was during the summer of rage during the George Floyd riots when Black Lives Matter thugs were terrorizing our streets, looting our businesses, burning our cities. In other words, Kamala Harris encouraged people to pay money to bail out dangerous BLM criminals who were torching our cities. And that tweet is still active on her ex account today, by the way. She does not regret it. She's not trying to hide it. Kamala Harris stands by the 2020 BLM riots and actively seeks to let violent criminals out of prison. And this is what's happened as a result. And I quote, Minneapolis station Fox 9 reported that the fund, the Minnesota Freedom Fund, spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to free an alleged knife murderer and a convicted rapist who was facing charges of sexual assault and kidnapping, among others. Another criminal, George Howard, aged 48, also reaped the benefits of the fund. He was allegedly involved in a road rage altercation on an Interstate 94 entrance ramp before he shot another driver, according to Minneapolis police, weeks after bailing out on domestic assault charges. End quote. By October of 2021, after the summer of terrorism and destruction and attacks on police by Black Lives Matter, according to a Pew Research poll, only 15%, 15%, teeny tiny bit, of Americans support defunding the police. Only 23% of black people support that. But Kamala Harris supports it. Kamala Harris said she applauds Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti's move to slash $150 million from the police budget. Gross, dangerous, and wildly out of step with American voters, both Democrats and Republicans, and out of step with her cherished demographic that she thinks she can control, black voters. In fact, 36% of black Democrats and 37% of black Republicans say funding for police departments should increase. Hammer these points home, people. There's a reason the mainstream media and the left are lying about Kamala's record. The left fears that you will know the truth about Kamala the border czar and Kamala the commie who encourages Black Lives Matter violence. All right, I told you guys last week, if you leave me a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, then I will read your comments, every single one of them, give you a shout out on the show. And we are going to do that here in just a couple minutes. But first, I was looking at the YouTube comments on the episodes from last week. And oh my gosh, you guys are like unofficially part of my research team here. I wanna read you a comment. So remember last week, we were talking about Kamala Harris and her father being a Marxist, right? That's, and how strange it is, or maybe not so strange, that people like Pete Buttigieg, like Chesa Boudin, Kamala Harris, how their parents are open communists. And yet the mainstream media and the left, of course, have no curiosity about this. They don't care whether there's an ideological connection in addition to the biological relation. But Buzz Salman on YouTube leaves me this comment and says, Fonnie Willis also belongs in the same group. Remember that her father is a Black Panther. What's the old saying about the apple doesn't fall far from the tree? I did not know this, so I looked it up, I Googled it, and sure enough, this is from the New York Post. The father of the Georgia district attorney prosecuting Donald Trump was a prominent Black Panther who called police the enemy. This according to New York recordings, John C. Floyd III, whose daughter, Fonnie Willis, is the Fulton County Georgia district attorney, told academic researchers that he considered police in his native Los Angeles in the 1960s to be a, quote, occupying army that was, quote, nothing but trouble. Floyd, who is now 80 years old, also called a prominent white politician of the era a Texas cracker, 
and he suggested that he believed conspiracy theories of that Malcolm X was assassinated by the CIA. Floyd is extremely close to his daughter, Willis, who has brought a sprawling anti-racketeering case against the former president and 18 others. Willis told the Post she speaks to her father as much as 10 times a day and that his values continued to guide her. She did not directly address his past as a Black Panther. Well, of course she didn't. The Black Panthers are communists. It is probably not coincidental, but it is always shocking to find out that these very radical individuals who hate America, their parents are communists. Their parents are communists. All right, now for our cultural hot button topic. This is a really nasty one. Do your kids w watch Mr. Beast on YouTube? Have they been unwittingly exposed to gender confusion because of it? If they are on YouTube or have access to a smartphone, the answer to this question is probably yes. They probably have seen Mr. Beast and they have been exposed to that ideological sickness known as gender ideology on his show. And parents, by the way, really need to question whether they should let their kids watch at all in light of new allegations that a former longtime co-host, a man who now identifies as a woman, is accused of acting inappropriately towards children, towards minor. So let's break down who Mr. Beast is in case you're not familiar with it. Many of you probably are, some of you may not be. Mr. Beast, whose real name is Jimmy Donaldson, is the world's number one YouTuber. He has 300 million subscribers. He's racked up more than 50 billion views on his YouTube channel. And don't get me wrong, his videos are actually kind of entertaining. They, they focus on like game shows and physical challenges, blowing up cars, things like that. Something that doesn't sound super harmful, right? Didn't used to seem to have an ideological bent. And like I said, I've seen a few of his videos. They're, they're kind of interesting, kind of addicting to watch. Well, it all sounds fine and well, except for the fact that Mr. Beast's former co-host since 2012, a guy by the name of Chris Tyson, publicly announced in early 2023 that he wanted to be known now as Ava and that he had begun taking hormones to start the process of transitioning to a woman. Keep in mind that Chris is the father of a little boy and he had recently divorced his wife. He'd broken up their family, broken up his marriage so that he could live in gender delusion. And at first, Mr. Beast vocally supported Chris in this transgender transition and let him remain on the show. Critics, right, including me, rightly sounded the alarm that Mr. Beast's YouTube channel was now exposing millions of children to this perversion and spreading the lie that men can become women. As recently as June of 2024, Mr. Beast defended Chris against online commentators who condemned Chris for breaking up his marriage and promoting this gender confusion. That alone shows that Mr. Beast is not something your children should be watching if you care about safeguarding their innocence. Well, it gets worse. Now Mr. Beast is embroiled in more criticism in the face of some credible allegations that Chris Tyson sent inappropriate, sexually suggestive comments to minors in group chats, allegedly even grooming these young children. Now, before we dive into the details of that, it should be known that the evidence suggests Chris was always a sexual deviant. And we can claim that based on his reportedly public online statements. For example, and I apologize that this is kind of graphic, but I figured you guys want to know what these allegations are, particularly if this is something that's in the awareness, the consciousness of your children. Chris Tyson reportedly tweeted, and I quote, nothing gets me cranking my knob like some lolly. Now, lolly, if you're not familiar with this, and I hope you aren't, refers to a kind of Japanese anime that depicts young boys and young girls in sexually explicit positions. It's, if not child pornography, it's borderline child pornography, but in animated form. And defenders of this tweet claimed that it was just an edgy joke that Chris Tyson was making, but anybody who would even joke about masturbating to child pornography, animated or not, is obviously a disgusting and disturbed individual. Chris Tyson also reportedly supported an online artist who has drawn animated child pornography and even hung up a painting by the artist in his apartment, which was visible in some of his live stream videos. And you have to ask, wouldn't Mr. Beast have known this? The two, Mr. Beast and Chris Tyson were very close. They were even roommates at one point. Chris Tyson also allegedly had other posts online commenting on the appearance of young children in a disturbing sexual manner. Now, fast forward to June and July of 2024, two separate videos went viral accusing Chris Tyson of sending suggestive content to minors when Chris was an adult. Now, why is an adult talking to minors online at all? In the first place, in what context is that appropriate? I would argue never. After these allegations gained steam online, Chris Tyson posted the following statement to X. He said, I would like to apologize for any of my past behavior or comments if it hurt or offended anyone. It was not my intent. 
Seeing recent events, we've mutually decided it's best I permanently step away from all things Mr. Beast and social media to focus on my family and mental health. I want to add, he said, I never groomed anyone. The person who gets brought up in these accusations, Lava GS, has vocally supported that they are false. Having said that, Chris says, I humbly apologize to anyone I have hurt with my unacceptable social media posts, past actions, and to those who may feel betrayed by how I used to act online. To lump those two factors together to create a narrative that my behavior extended beyond bad, edgy jokes is disgusting and did not happen. In past years, I've learned that my old humor is not acceptable. I cannot change who I was, but I can continue to work on myself. I don't want these accusations to impact the hundreds of people who work at Mr. Beast, which is why I stepped away. Lava, who is now 20, has since come out and said that having reread these messages, and he, this, was the, this was the individual um, that Chris Tyson is accused of grooming, that they should not have happened with me and any other minor. He said, I was a minor in this situation and not the adult influencer who shouldn't have allowed this to happen. I did not see this, I did not see this as being wrong at the time. Lava does deny that he was groomed, but let's be very clear here. This is a form of grooming, whether the victim recognizes that or not. Mr. Beast issued the following condemnation of Chris Tyson and announced that he would be stepping away from Mr. Beast, but I don't know if this is good enough. He said, over the last few days, I've become aware of the serious allegations of Ava Tyson's behavior online, and I'm disgusted and opposed to such unacceptable acts. Notice Mr. Beast is still is calling Chris Ava, affirming the delusion, the dangerous lie that Chris can somehow become a woman. During that time, Mr. Beast said, I've been focused on hiring an independent third party to conduct a thorough investigation to ensure that I have all the facts. That said, I've seen enough online and taken immediate action to remove Ava from the company, my channel, and any association with Mr. Beast. I do not condone or support any of the inappropriate actions. He concludes by saying, I will allow the independent investigators the necessary time to conduct a comprehensive investigation and will take any further action based on their finding. Now, let me just say this. This is obviously a carefully crafted legal statement. Chris is off the show, but he should have been booted a long, long time ago. And let's also be very clear. Mr. Beast indulged this delusion. The fact that Mr. Beast indulged the dangerous delusion of gender ideology is partly to blame here. Chris Tyson is a man. Chris Tyson, the man, abandoned his family, his wife, his child. Chris Tyson admitted in tweets to watching pornography that portrays children as sexual objects, animated or not. It's disgusting, it's perverted, it's disordered, it's evil. Mr. Beast indulged this perverted delusion by calling Chris Ava, by referring to Chris as her. I am so sick and tired of people like Mr. Beast who want to be politically correct, celebrating, celebrating LGBTQIA perversion and ignoring the glaring red flags of this behavior. Maybe if instead Mr. Beast had said, actually, it's gross and immoral and harmful to watch pornography, it should be illegal. Pornography, even if it's animated, that portrays children is evil. Men cannot be women, and men who abandon their families should be run from society, then you wouldn't be so surprised to discover that your perverted employee is perverted. Stop indulging dangerous delusions. It hurts people. And parents, don't let your children watch YouTube, no matter how innocent the content may seem. It's not. With me now is the host of Fearless, Jason Whitlock. Jason, good to see you. Good to be here, Liz. Thanks for having me. Welcome okay, Jason. Aboard. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so delighted to be here following in your footsteps here at Blaze Media. Okay, there's some debate, especially on X. I'm sure you've seen this among conservatives about the best way to campaign against Kamala Harris. I don't want to say attack her because <laughs> I obviously don't mean physically attack her, but the best way to campaign against her to highlight the dangerous parts of her policies and her record, etc. And the, one of the interesting arguments that's going on right now is some conservatives are saying, listen, Kamala Harris has accomplished basically nothing. She is a DEI hire. But Joe Biden said before he announced her as vice presidential running mate, you know, five years ago, that he would pick a black woman to be his vice president. And to me, that's kind of insulting. We'll get to that in a minute. But there are some conservatives now who say we shouldn't be calling Kamala a DEI hire because that won't play well with women voters. Where do you fall in this argument? Well, uh, I, I'm not a political strategist type person. And so I understand the politics of it and I understand the people 
that are advising, hey, stay away from that. It, 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 it will distract from a more meaningful argument of like, hey, this is a uh, raised and devout San Francisco politician. And so if you want America to be like Northern California and like San Francisco, yeah, let's bring Kamala Harris into the Oval Office and make her president. I get that. As someone that believes in unvarnished truth, I think calling her a DEI hire is completely accurate and appropriate. I'm not sure if it's the best thing to do politically, so I get people's argument, but I think we're living uh, in a time where authenticity and unvarnished truth are in desperate need of being aired out. I think it's a part of Trump's popularity and why he resonates. But if you're looking for ways to avoid inspiring the feminists, the people that lean into victimization and, and want politics, which has always been a full contact sport, that, that, oh, well, now there's a black woman, so it can't be full contact because that's racist or that's sexist. And we went through this with Barack Obama, with everybody kind of dancing around with kid gloves, afraid to say what they really thought. Um, so again, I understand the advice. I'm not going to take it because I'm not a political person. <laughs> She's a DEI hire. She slept she her way is. to the top. All of that's appropriate for me. Okay, so talk to me about that second part, the Willie Brown part. Most people are familiar with this part of Kamala Harris's history, but when she was a young, political, aspiring politico, she slept with a very powerful politician, Willie Brown, in California. She had an affair with him, actually. This is not, I mean, it's scandalous. It's not gossip because they were they were open about it. Willie Brown said, yes, I, I dated Kamala Harris when I was married. Um, there are people who make excuses for this, but the fact of the matter is she slept her way to the top. That's simply that's simply the reality. I do understand, by the way, that maybe that's not the best line of attack for President Trump to take against her, given his own history. I get that. There's different people that that um, different attacks are better suited for when it comes to politics. But I think this is like a very powerful a uh, piece of rhetoric to use against her, a very powerful piece of her own history, because it shows her character. It shows that she's conniving. It shows that she is a uh, a person uh, just, I mean, you sleep your way to the top. Come on. Who wants that in a president of the United States? I don't think a lot of swing voters, a lot of independent voters, particularly maybe white working class would like that. And it will impact people's votes. So I guess I don't quite understand why they're not using that more. Look, I have to give uh, Clay Travis credit. He pointed something out last week uh, that, so a woman, a, a, a side piece, a side chick who ruined a marriage or helped, I, I don't know, maybe the marriage survived, but Willie Brown was married, three kids. She's the side piece. This is some, this has got to be women's worst nightmare. Who, who wants to empower the home wrecker? And, and, but that's what we're talking about doing. And, and it's like, oh, don't talk about that. that that's too personal. Look, Gary Hart and a long list of politicians were destroyed by extramarital affairs. It nearly ruined Bill Clinton's presidency. Uh, why do we need to throw it out the window? Because an Indian woman who claims to be black, uh, you know, well, that's unfair. Don't bring it up. I, I think it's all fair game. I, th I think it speaks to her character. I think it's it speaks to you know her lack of qualifications. Uh, so I, I think it's all fair game, and I think it should all be aired out. And you know the truth sets us free, and and the people that will be offended and off put by that and say it's unfair, I'm not sure they can be reached anyway. I would add and say the truth sets us free if we don't sand off the edges. This is one of my biggest criticisms of the conservative movement in the Republican Party is that when we're talking about DEI, when we're talking about Willie Brown, this is also true actually when we're talking about abortion, specifically as it relates to the Democrats using abortion as their main recruitment tool for white liberal women. I think Republicans lose some of these arguments sometimes because they refuse to be totally based. They'll only go like 70 or 80% to make the argument. Like they'll just say, 
Kamala's a DEI hire. And then they try to qualify it or they try to make try to make it not offensive. Instead of being like, this is an insult to women, it's an insult to black people. Every time you see a woman in a position of power now, you wonder if she got there based on her own merit or if she was elevated just because of her, her genitalia. You see a black person in a position of power, you wonder the same thing. And what's worse, women and black people have to wonder that about themselves in a world of DEI. This is evil, Kamala's dangerous. And I wonder if we would win more of these arguments by not only not shying away from those topics, but using the full truth and the full force of the whole truth to set us free. Am I wrong about this or are the, are, is the Republican Party wrong? No, you're not wrong. And I think people have to unpack it very calmly, without emotion, and just connect all the dots. It's just like the pro-abortion aspect of Kamala Harris. And yeah, I talk about it all the time, about if your worldview is that life begins outside of the womb, you have a, a negative uh, culture of death mentality that drives a lot of your decision making and you're not willing to deal with the fact that women that have abortions have emotional issues that haunt them for the rest of their lives. We never unpack all the different ramifications uh, and that's what you're talking about here in terms of DEI. It undermines the confidence of minorities and people of color. It calls into question their qualifications. And, and, and so it, it's unhealthy. There's ramifications for all these different things we're doing to protect people's feelings. Yeah. And, and, and we don't need to protect feelings. We need to protect the truth in reality. Uh, that's far more important than someone's, you know, we, we just have to go back to sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never harm me. And, and we've gotten away from that. And, and it, it's K Kamala is an affront. And I don't say this with, with, but just her pretending to be a black woman, that's an affront to me. And, and, and th that's not out of some racial pride of, hey, I don't want you in this group, but it's just she's piggybacking something that her family heritage has nothing to do with. Her mother's an Indian. Her father was from Jamaica. She's not a part of, of the people that uh, are whose ancestors uh, were slaves. This is just like a, a grift. She's no different than Barack Obama used it as a grift to advance his career. We got to cut this out and we got to call this out for what it is. This is a grifter who's a Marxist, believes in equity, and has been raised in that Northern California, San Francisco, elitist, socialist, communist mindset. And just go look at San Francisco and do we, is that really what we want for the rest of the nation? It's. We got to call it out. And, and that, by the way, yeah. I think you can see this when, I don't know if you've noticed this, but when Kamala Harris is talking to, if she's speaking to or campaigning in front of black people, she suddenly gets like black dialect creeping into her speech. But when she's not in front of black people, not pandering to them, it's nowhere to be found. Yeah, that's code switching or what? They do it all the time. This, and that's why we, we have to, myself, I'm a believer all these identities that we're taking on that have nothing to do with Jesus Christ, they're all a burden. And and so this black identity and people waking up every day trying to prove how black they are. And, that, oh, you know how you can prove you're black? Vote for Kamala Harris. I wake up every day, and we all need to start waking up every day, those of us that are believers. I just want to prove I'm a Christian and just leave it at that. And, and all, all these other things are a distraction that are actually killing, harming us. And it's why, again, we have drag queens in schools and wh why we have just all the chaos. The, we're just, we're destroying ourselves with our idolatry. We are. And part of the reason that idolatry has become so prevalent, I think, is you hit the nail on the head because we blunt the edges of truth. We're trying to be too gentle with truth. Sometimes the truth itself, we may not be intending to be bombastic. We are not intending to offend people. We are not intending for someone to be harmed by it. But the truth is not always easy to hear, but it doesn't make it any less valuable. Jason Whitlock, thank you, my friend, for being on the show. I appreciate it. Liz, thank you. 
Okay, it's time for X marks the spot because all the good things happen on X. <laughs> Sometimes I guess all the bad things too. In this case, there's a post from a man by the name of Ben Zeisloft. He's a Protestant influencer on X and he has a post that I think warrants a response because it may have the potential to impact how a lot of Christians vote in the presidential election in 2024. And I think he's totally wrong. So I wanna respond to him directly. He starts by quoting President Trump who at a recent rally said, Christians get out and vote. And Ben responds to that quote from Trump by saying, with respect to Donald Trump, you lost my vote by compromising on abortion. I want to vote for you, but I cannot vote for anyone who supports child sacrifice. I refuse to reward betrayal with my vote. And so this is my response, a refusal to vote for Donald Trump. And this is something we hear from some evangelical or Protestant Christians. A refusal to vote for Donald Trump is a vote for Kamala Harris. Now, you don't have to like Donald Trump's verbal stance on abortion during this campaign. I don't, I don't like it. I'm more of an abortion absolutist. You may feel that a vote for Donald Trump is the lesser of two evils on abortion. But if we don't elect Donald Trump, who was, by the way, without a doubt, the most pro-life president of our lifetime, we will instead have in the White House someone who is so pro-abortion, she's a crony of Planned Parenthood a woman who targeted a journalist when she was the attorney general of California because this journalist exposed Planned Parenthood's crimes of trafficking in aborted baby body parts. A woman who believes and celebrates abortion up until the moment of birth, who prides herself on being the first vice president to visit an abortion clinic. That's evil. We should certainly encourage Trump to be 100% pro-life, and I do. But make no mistake, it is our moral duty as Christians to vote against Kamala Harris in the White House by voting for Donald Trump in November. And by the way, I had a heated debate with Chris Cuomo on his show this week about abortion specifically, because I think Republicans, conservatives, even the Trump campaign are missing the mark on how abortion should be argued, how we should advocate for a pro-life society. And I went at it with Chris Cuomo. Take a look at this. When we're talking about abortion, oftentimes the left uses these euphemisms like reproductive rights or access or health care. That's not what abortion is. And I would pose to both of you tonight to answer the question, what is abortion? What is an abortion procedure in the first trimester? It suffocates the unborn Chris, baby. What is I, an abortion procedure that? in the second? No, you cannot until I'm yeah, done. Go ahead. In well, the no, when Liz is done, I'll give it back to you, Mallory. All right, thank in you. In the second trimester, an abortion takes a vacuum and suctions the baby's limb from limb apart in their mother's womb. In the third trimester, the baby is given a lethal injection to the heart and then its skull is crushed with forceps before it's removed from the mother's womb. This is a brutal, gruesome procedure. And there's a reason that 80% of the American people, 80%, think that abortion should be illegal in the third trimester. There's a reason that That's over 60% of people about, believe that Liz. it should be illegal in the second trimester. Kamala Harris is so, so radical on this. And listen, both of you, I know, Chris, that you're Catholic. I know, Mallory, you said you were raised Catholic. You right. know that life begins at conception. You know these are human beings with value and oh, dignity. Hold on. They deserve Liz. better. They deserve their right to Liz, life. I, I, I hear you. I get the argument, just to be clear. My faith is not and should not be the law of the land in a secular society. Okay, what I was raised to believe, that's on me, that's for me and whoever I'm with, that's for me with my kids, that doesn't make it okay to put on everybody else. And I really think we want to be well, we careful about that. We have morals day, in our law though. But let me just but make Liz, sure, we have morals morality, in our law. Like the reason that I'm not allowed to is murder thing. you is because as human beings, no. we have more dignity and value than animals. Where is that begot of? Our religious beliefs. So we have this sort of fundamental idea of right and wrong Judeo in our law. Judeo-Christian ethics are relevant yes. to the law, but this is something far more specific. And the reason I'm cautious about it is that someday, Liz, this may be a Muslim majority country. And then what? Are we going to be OK with them putting their rules on us because they're the majority? Not for me. I say, let's stop it right now. But I appreciate your points to, What your does that arguments. have to do with protecting life in the womb, though? Well, because what if they have different rules that you don't like, but they're specific to their religion? But that's and because like a wild they're the majority, they didn't get to put them on everybody to dodge else. The question right now. Well, uh, let me ask you this: no. from a purely scientific standpoint, when does when does a human life begin? When does a person with rights attach in the pregnancy process? When does that a human the issue life begin? In Dobbs scientifically, and in Roe. just scientifically, purely scientifically, when scientifically, does a human life begin? Scientifically, listen. This is a silly conversation because two human beings can only make a human. <laughs> I think it's an incredibly relevant question. But the question is, when question. is it a person with rights? 
You believe at conception. My religion teaches at conception. No, no, no. I'm Jews not talking about religion. Believe something I'm talking else. scientifically. Scientifically, when does a human life begin? The question, the question isn't about the potential life. It's about when is it a fetus that becomes a person under the law. And that is how abortion should be argued. Take note, Republicans. Even take note, Trump campaign. You know I support Donald Trump. I think that he was a great president. I'm going to vote for him again. I think he will be a great president again. But I do think that he should tweak his rhetoric on abortion. And I think... I think conservatives and Christians, especially like Ben, would be more motivated to turn out and vote if Donald Trump was vocally more based or as based on abortion as his actions proved that he was during his last administration. Okay, so last week on the show, I said, anybody who leaves me a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, I will give a shout out to you on my show. So let's go ahead and do that. Oh, that's a four-star review. Sorry, can't give you a shout out. Four-star review, go revise it to a five-star review. (laughs) Club 1025 says, just found you on Twitter. How refreshing. By the way, I don't mind if you preach. Thank you. And welcome aboard. We are delighted to have you. Jeff Duvall says, glad to have you back. Jeff. Jeff, it is so glad to be back. You have no idea. I was dying. I was dying during my little hiatus. Zach says, I love the show. So glad it Liz is back and all went well with the pregnancy. Looking forward to what she has to say on the news of the day. That is so sweet. You guys just warm my heart, really. And also, I'm also glad that everything went well with the pregnancy. Nathan says, love it. I love your show. I've missed it. I'm so glad to have you back. Thanks for having Alex Jones on your show. Let me tell you, that one was so fun to do. He's an extremely entertaining person. Uh, Scotty says, love your show, Liz. I love the content in your show and how you deliver the information. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Scotty. Will do. Speedy says, incredible researcher. Liz is my favorite political commentator. Not only do I love her viewpoint, she researches and finds the most fascinating information that other conservative commentators aren't picking up on. She's so good. Thank you. Lay says, the Liz Wheeler Show is a beacon of insightful, principled commentary in today's media landscape. Her thoughtful analysis and articulate delivery make complex political issues accessible and engaging. You know what? That actually means a lot to me because that's one of the things that I try to do whenever I'm consuming all this news. I try to take a whole bucket of information and distill it into just this this sound bite, this little this little bite sized um, piece that no matter how busy you are, no matter what you do for a living, that you're able to you know intake that. I know how busy people are, and it's so nice to have just this condensed version of what you need to know. So I'm glad that you see that because that's really what I'm trying to do. IDAD1972 says, I've been following Liz Wheeler since her days on OANN. Glad, so glad you're back. Love the show. Well, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Love Orb says, one of my favorites. Glad you're back with the American flag. Jordan says, your show is phenomenal. That guy from Illinois says, with Kamala Harris supporting the terrorist, we should start calling it the Hamas administration. Glad you're back. Congratulations on your daughter. Have a great day. She is a Marxist. She absolutely is a Marxist. Going too crazy said, love the show, very informative. Thank you, appreciate that. Unseer says, keep praying, keep the truth out there and hopefully someday America will see the light again. Listen, I pray both at the beginning of the show, but also I pray for this country because this country is such a wonderful place, but we're not guaranteed that forever. And the power of prayer is very real. Sin Alaska says, thanks for the work, keep it up. Personally, I really like starting the show with the St. Michael prayer, me too. I have no intention of stopping that. And it, isn't it interesting how almost every episode or every video that we've done so far, that's the predominant comment about the St. Michael prayer? Kind of shows you that everyone, that we all understand this spiritual warfare all around, all around us. Warren Mom says, I always look forward to listening to your show. I love your point of view and how you're fighting for conservatives to be heard and respected. Thanks for all that you're doing. My pleasure. Eva says, fearless reporting. I remember watching a small snippet of you when you were on OAN. I started thinking that you needed a much, needed to be seen and heard on a much bigger platform. Now you are all over the place and I for one am so happy for you. Thank you. It's been, listen, OAN was the time of my life. I was on that network for five years and built an incredible show. It seems like a really long time ago now. And it's been the adventure, the adventure of a lifetime to build up the show to what it is now. And to be now on Blaze Media is, so exciting. I mean, this is, we started last week and it's already loving every minute of it. All right. 
Izzy says, Liz, what an amazing show you have. You consistently provide up-to-date, relevant information about our political and cultural climate. I love listening to you, and I appreciate your commitment to honesty. We need more brave voices speaking out against corruption. You are no doubt leading the way in this area. Continue to share your faith as well. This country needs Jesus. Keep up the good work. A faithful listener and friend, Izzy B. Izzy, thank you so much. Please tell my sister to watch the show. Slavery slavery oh nice username says liz wheeler is a political commentator with her own unique take on things she goes deeper than most other commentators and will give you a history on topics and how they came to where they are through a unique prism it's a good review a weird username dj says liz pulls no punches and i love her for that she's smart entertaining charismatic charming and often funny you think i'm funny thank you i think i'm funny too but i think the internet is torn on <laughs> the internet's kind of half and half on whether i am or not um, BAP says, love your take on Blaze and Apple and that you're not afraid to be you, conservative and Catholic. Looking forward to more. Steve says, calm and objective. Ooh, Steve, nice. Nice, I appreciate that one. Deb, <laughs> Deb Texas Boomer, that is a good username. <laughs> says, listen to you for the first time this week after you launched on the Blaze. Love your show. Deb, thank you. Welcome. We are delighted to have you guys. These reviews, as you can tell, warm my heart, encourage me, and motivate me to keep going. We are just getting started here. Thank you all. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. I'm Liz Wheeler. This is The Liz Wheeler Show.